All right, good singing. I was thinking about that second verse um, about neighbors, right? And I love them, everyone. And then I looked at the fact that the song was written in the 1940s. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that was a different time altogether. How many of you don't even know your neighbors? Anybody like that? Oh, you all know your neighbors. You probably lived in the same house for 30 years, but people don't want to know their neighbors anymore. Okay, well, we are, um, we're going to be looking here together tonight at the, um, at the story of, if I can get this up here, we're going to look at the story of Balaam in the book of, in the book of Numbers. So let's find Numbers in our Bible tonight. Now, as you know, I, now that we've got some things sorted here in the auditorium, I'm not printing off the, um, the sheets unless you have requested and, uh, did I hear murmuring? <laughs> oh, that was you, Corinne. Oh, okay. Um, so I have a sheet of paper. Who had that? Isaac, you had that sheet of paper? He's left. Oh, it's in the back. Okay. So a after church, we'll leave that on the back table there. If you want printed notes, just put your name on that sheet of paper, and, and then I'll just print whatever I can for you. I just I don't want to print 80 copies and then throw 40 of them away. So... Um, so I only printed, I think, like seven or eight copies tonight for those who put their name on it last week, okay? So is that right? So just put your, put your name back there. We'll give you copies of that um, beginning next week. Um, Earhart, I saw you. Did, were you going to say something to me? Oh, got it. Okay. It's on there. It should be good. All right. So we're in, um, we're in the book of Numbers chapter 22. Okay, this is one of the classic stories of the Bible. How many of you know the story of Balaam? All right. This, this is a story that has captivated the attention of, of every kid that ever read this in the Bible, right? And still, when you get older, it still captivates your attention. Uh, there are, there are a few places in the Bible that make me laugh, and this is one of those. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some places where you just see God's sense of humor. Uh, now, he didn't do this because he has a sense of humor, but you can see his sense of humor in all of this. And so uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at this here uh, together tonight. But what I want to do, first of all, is uh, I just want to give you some introduction here as far as um, where we're at at this point. So let me just give you a bit of, of introduction that leads us to this point. So after the rebellion of the spies and the nation as a whole, we went through this a few weeks back. Uh, remember, the spies went up into the promised land from Kadesh Barnea. Uh, what, how many of you remember what Kadesh is also known as? It's all, Kadesh is, can you hear me okay? Kadesh is also known as Petra. It's at the same, same area. Now you would know Petra in Jordan, right? You'd know what that area is. So the spies went north from Kadesh and they spied out the land for those days and they came back and they brought their report and the 10 gave a negative report and it was only Joshua and Caleb said, hey, no, let's go conquer at once. And so because of the rebellion of the, of the people, then God uh, pronounced judgment there uh, upon his people because they said, we're not going to do this. We don't believe God. We want to go back to Egypt. So th they were now given the, it wasn't really an ultimatum as, as much as it was a judgment on those that were over the age of 20 that were a part of this rebellion against the Lord. It was time for them to wander in the wilderness uh, for that sum total of how many years? Yeah, a sum total of 40 years, there was going to be a wandering now, and everybody over the age of 20, uh, they were going to die. And God said, I'm not going to take a bunch of rebels into the promised land. And so that started this rebellion uh, that didn't stop just when the spies came back. That rebellion continued on, and it manifested itself a number of times over these years. So it was somewhere around this time in, in Kadesh area where, where all of this started. The spies came back to Kadesh. It was around this time where um, the ground uh, opened up and swallowed Korah because Korah was rebellious against Moses. Do you remember the story of Korah? Now, I realize that there's a whole lot of these stories that I haven't, we haven't gone through and discussed, so I'm going to trust that you're familiar with it because you've read through the Old Testament. But this is pretty much around Kadesh where the ground opened up. Uh, it, it swallowed Korah and his whole family 
And then there was a whole bunch of the, the, the older, more mature, um, what, what God refers to as elders of the tribes that were also a part of Korah's rebellion. They were rising up in rebellion against Moses' leadership, okay? And so God did a new thing, split the ground, and swallowed them whole, okay? Well, all of this took place at Kadesh, which is, which is essentially where Petra is. Um, it was around this time that uh, Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, she died. And then it was around this time where Moses, Moses himself uh, struck the rock to bring water out of the rock. That was around this time. So it was after, after their rebellion, and God said, okay, you're going to wander, and then these things begin to happen. So remember now, Moses, Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but he got mad, and he said, must we fetch you water out of the rock, you rebels? And then he smacked the rock, and God, in his mercy, still brought water out to water his people, give them what they needed. But Moses forfeited his ability to get into the promised land, his entrance into Canaan because of what he had done. So, so these events that I just said to you, Korah, Miriam dying, Moses striking the rock, all of these happened uh, within the first two years after the spies came back with their, their evil report. Okay, so two years. Uh, so Moses now in, in Numbers and then later in Deuteronomy, knows, Moses now is going to pick up the narrative of the nation but Moses picks up that narrative a whole lot later at the close of their wilderness, wilderness wanderings. So, so keep in mind, the spies did what they did and came back with their report. The nation rebelled. God said, you're all going to die. You're just going to wander. They, they left the, the immediate area, but they were still in the Kadesh area. Kor rebelled. The ground opened up. It was just right after that that Miriam died. It was just right after that that Moses got frustrated and smacked the rock. All of this happened within a couple of year period of time. And then there's just radio silence as far as the authorship of these events. Then Moses picks that up again and starts telling the story at the very end of that 40-year wandering. Okay, so that's pretty much where we, we find ourselves now. So now, now the year is uh, 1451 B.C., 1451, the people of Israel now have wandered in the wilderness around Kadesh for about 37 years to this point. That's a long time to wander in a desert. Okay, so they've wandered now for about 37 years. Um, Moses now has twice sent to the king of Edom, uh, and I'll show you a map here in just a moment, but he sent twice now to the king of Edom and asked for, for permission for Israel to travel through their northern border uh, so that Israel could get to the promised land. And um, so basically Petra is, is, is here. Actually, you know what? Let me just show you this. We'll come back to this in a minute. Can you see that okay? So you see where Petra is. Uh, they, they did their wanderings uh, between Petra and where you see Mount Hor is. And then eventually they ended, up, they ended up traveling this direction on the way up. When you see Jericho, you see the Amorites. Okay, so pretty much this is happening right in this area toward the bottom here. And Moses from here has sent to the king of Edom, says, hey, we want to we wanna pass through your area. He didn't want to travel down and around, as you see. He wanted to go straight up the, the most direct route. And the king of Edom said, no, we're not going to do that. He wouldn't let him happen. So Edom, the king of Edom, what he did was he sent his army down to the southernmost border of Edom to prevent Israel from going north. So what that did was that pushed Israel south and having to go the long way rather than the direct route. Now, how many of you remember when they left Egypt that what their intention was? Their intention was what ours is when we want to go somewhere. Any typical guy, here's what the, the thing is. We are going to leave point A, and we are going to take the most direct route to point B. Pretty much every guy I know, that's how they think, okay? And so Israel, they're like, okay, we're leaving Goshen, and we're going to end, our, end up in Canaan. We're going to take a direct route across the top. And God said, no, you're actually going to go to the bottom. And it's the same way here, the same way here. They wanted to go directly north, and, and the king of Edom said, that's not going to happen. He sent his army down uh, to keep them from going, all right? So that's the, at the border of Kadesh is where the, the Edomite army came down to. So because of the fact that the army came down south and would not allow Israel to go north, then what happened in, in uh, Judges 11 is you find out that they ended up staying a little bit longer uh, there in the Kadesh area than, uh, than they had originally planned. Let me just read you uh, this one verse in Judges chapter 11, just so you can, you can hear what he had to say. Um, Verse number 17, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. 
And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. So because they couldn't go north, they didn't know what to do, so they just stayed put uh, in Kadesh. Does everybody see what's happening here? Okay, now, if you, don't, if you don't study and research this out, then what happens is you'll read through the narrative of the Exodus in the Bible, but you can't, you can't see it unless you see it this way. And this really helps you to just know what took place and how it took place, because you can actually find it on the map here. So I just wanted you to be able to see this. And so because of Edom's army, they eventually made their way southward, as you see here, and they went down to Isaiah Gabar, which is here. This is at the very tip of the, of the Red Sea. So the, it forks, as we've talked about. And so this is that, that uh, sort of port town there at the tip of the Red Sea. And they ended up heading down there. But they stopped first at Mount Hor, as you see here. So they left the Petra area, which is Kadesh. And they wandered down to Mount Hor. And Mount Hor is the place where Aaron dies. Aaron, the, the brother of Moses and of Miriam. So Aaron dies there. And Aaron died at Mount Hor four months after Miriam. So Miriam dies between Petra and Mount Hor. And then four months later, her brother Aaron dies. And that's at that mountain where they were, okay? And by the way, this is seven months before Moses dies. So we all know Moses, where, where Moses ended up, right? He, if you look at the top of the map where it says the Amorites and then Jericho, uh, you may be able to see there's the Jordan River just runs directly north. And it was just on this side of the Jordan River where there's a, a mountain there, Mount Pisgah. And that's where God took Moses up so he could see the promised land. And then Moses died at that point, okay? That was seven months after Miriam dies. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, after, after, um, uh, after Aaron dies. It's seven months. So you're in Numbers chapter, where did I say, 22? Why don't you just jump over to chapter 33 real quick of the same book. Numbers 33. And look at verse number 37. I'm just trying to give you context before we get into the story of Balaam. Numbers 33 and verse 37. And they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there. Notice this, in the 40th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. So God is very deliberate about the dates. So you can see this is at the very end of their wilderness wandering now. But now this is in the first day of the fifth month of that year. And this is where Aaron dies. So now they continue south uh, toward the Red Sea, as you can see. And uh, Mount Seir, this is in Deuteronomy chapter number 2. I'll let me read you this verse. Deuteronomy 2. It says, and then we turned and we took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea as the Lord spake unto me and we compassed Mount Seir many days. So Mount Seir is just down here and uh, this is where they were uh, as they went southward and then the people became impatient due to this long journey and they began to complain about everything and uh, it was at this time that God sent these, these fiery serpents, it's, it's actually Mount Seir's right here, these fiery serpents uh, that bit all of the people. In, uh, in this is in the same book of Numbers, Numbers chapter number 21. And, of course, you know the, um, the serpent on the pole. Okay, all of that, right? The brazen serpent. And that story took place uh, right there you see on the map. So then they moved north into Arnon, and uh, they killed Og, the king, king of Bashan. How many of you remember Og? Anybody remember Og? Is this one of those things where your eyes kind of glaze over when you read it in your Bible? So they, they, king, they, kill, um, they kill Og, who's the king of Bashan. Okay, the, the significance of that is that Og was the last of the giants. Okay, now they show up again, as we know, in David's time. Uh, and by the way, they're going to show up again during the tribulation, but that's a different story. So Deuteronomy chapter 3, let me read you this. This is verse number 11. For Og, the king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. And then he said, is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. That is long, 14, 15 feet long. That's a bed, I'll tell you what. So if you thought uh, you wanted to be a mover back in these days, but this is where they moved north and they killed, they killed Og, the king of Bashan. And then it was from here, if you notice some, where it says Deuteronomy there. Okay, this is, this is right where Og was up there. And it was from here that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy. So you're in, the, you're in Numbers uh, right there. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 1. 
just should be a few pages over. Verse number three, it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, right, that uh, Moses spake to the children of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in, in commandment unto them after he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Hezbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt at Ashtoreth and Edrai. All right, so this is, this is the reason I said this. This is where Deuteronomy came from. It was right after he killed Sihon and Og, which is right here, that God gave him the things that he was going to give to the new nation. Okay, let me just, let me pause. Look at me for a minute, if you would. The book of Deuteronomy is essentially a recap of God's dealing with Israel from the time that they left Egypt until they go into the promised land. Okay, it's basically a recap. The reason it's a recap is because it took place right here in the 40th year of their wandering. Now, what has happened at this point? Everybody who was 20 years old and up has died. So Moses now, as the old man, is recounting to all of who used to be the youngers, and now these are going to be the new adults that enter into the promised land. They don't know the history of their people. They don't know the history of, of their fathers and their rebellion against God after they left Egypt. So Moses is recounting all of that history in the book of Deuteronomy. And so that's, that takes place right here. And you can see how close in proximity from where that area is to where they get over into Jericho, across into the promised land. So this is taking place right here at the very end, the last few months before they enter into uh, the land of Canaan. That's where Deuteronomy takes place. So now, now they were led east of the territory of the Moabites and the Ammonites, and they find themselves, if you're looking on the map here, they find themselves due east of Jericho and the Jordan River. So you may not be able to see it, but uh, you probably can't see it, just a little bit of a blue line that comes up, and that's the, that's the, the Jordan River, and they are, they are due east of that, and that's where the, the nation find themselves right here. Um, and they ask the Amorites, as you see, I've put the, the three main countries here, the Edomites, where they pass through, and then you have the Moabites and then the Amorites. Notice where they, they lie in relation to Egypt and in relation to Canaan. So they've come up through that area and they wanted permission to come through the land and they weren't given permission. So when they get up to the, to the Moabites and the Amorites, they started killing people that were in their way because they were just trying to pass through. They didn't want the land, they wanted to go through it. And so now they get to this area of the Amorites here and they asked the Amorites for permission to pass through their land. They were refused. And so they destroyed the Amorites and they ended up taking their land. By the way, it wasn't the purpose of God, but God permitted that to happen. Uh, remember, this was not a part of the land that God promised to Abraham, to the Amorites. And so it says in Numbers 21, you don't have to go back there, but it just says this, that Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. Do you remember this? It was, the, it was the, the two and a half tribes that said, hey, can we just take our portion on this side of the Jordan? Okay, that's it right there. R right, right. And so it was just, well, we want our, our portion here. And Moses thought they, they weren't going to come over and help Israel conquer the land. And, and they ended up saying, no, we want to still do that, but we just want our portion on this side. So that's, that's where it was here. So Reuben and Gad had, had asked that permission to have their possession there on the eastern side of Jordan in the Amorite territory. And God said, yes, you can do that. So they destroyed, obviously, the, the Amorites. This is where Mount Pisgah is located. I said that where Moses was. Uh, he climbed that mountain. Think of how many times that guy climbed mountains, right? Seven times we know of Mount Sinai. And then he's climbing, the, uh, he's climbing Mount Pisgah as well. Uh, he viewed the promised land before he died. And so it's right here now that our story begins. And so what I want to do is I, I want to just begin this, this journey with you and talk, first of all, about the rise of Moab. Okay, Moab sees Israel uh, camping on their plains. We'll come back to this and let you see this. So they see Israel camping on their plains, and Moab is afraid. Um, they're afraid, and I'm going to go back to Numbers chapter 22. Look at chapter 22 of Numbers. We'll probably stay here most of our time tonight. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to now tell you this story. But when we get to the end of the story, I'm going to tell you why this story is important because it's more than a story. And it's going to have a direct, a direct application to your life when we get to the end of this, okay? So look at, uh, look at Numbers 22. It says, The children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. 
and it says that, um, that Balak, the son of Zippor, saw, that all Israel, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So we're talking about the king now, the king of the Amorites, uh, sees everything that they had done to the Moabites, and he thought, oh, this is bad. Okay, here they are. They're in our territory. This is really bad here. So he sees what they had destroyed. And so the king of, the king of Moab, that's, I think I said that the wrong way. Moab sees Israel and what Israel did to the Amorites. And so this is the king of Moabites now. The king of Moab, he sends back now to the people of Midian. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to bring Balaam here to curse Israel. So notice in this chapter, Moab, verse 3, was sore afraid of the people because there were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, now shall this company lick, us, lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. In other words, we're dead. Israel's going to come in here and just wipe us out. So it says, and Balak, the, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at this time. So he sent messengers, verse 5, therefore unto Balaam, the son of uh, Beor to Pethor, which is by the river, the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there's a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. So what he does is he sends now to, to hire Balaam. And notice what he asked Balaam to do in verse 6. Look in your Bible there. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. So does this tell you that Balaam had a reputation? Balaam had a reputation. Is everybody with me? Balak, who lived north, sent all the way down south to the area of Midian where he knew Balaam was. And he said, I want you to hire Balaam to come up here and he can curse this people. So it tells you that Balaam was known to be uh, a witch, a soothsayer, a spiritual man, a whatever. Okay, he, he had a reputation, Balaam did. And so the king of Moab sends back and he says, all right, military might isn't going to fix this problem. We need Balaam to come here and, and curse the people. And so notice in verse number seven what happens. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So notice they came with money and a message from the king. Notice that uh, they had these rewards, which we'll talk about here. Now, it's interesting that Balak's name means devastator. That's what the word means, his name. So they come from the king, and they say, we have money, we've got a reward with us, and the king wants you to come back and curse. And so it says uh, in verse number 8, Balaam now says, Lodge here this night, I'll bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me, and the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. So God comes to Balaam and says, what men are these with thee? Now, God didn't ask the question because he didn't know. God never asked a question he doesn't know, which means God knows everything anyway, right? So he said, who are these guys? And Balaam said, verse number 10, uh, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent unto me, saying, behold, there's a people come out of Egypt, which cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, maybe, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they're blessed. So Balaam rose up in the morning, said to the princes of Balak, Get you into your land. Go home, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. So the princes of Moab rose up and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. So Balaam now, Balak the king, whose name means devastator, he sends his guys down, the elders, and they've got money, rewards of divination in their hand. They come to Balaam and said, Hey, Balak the king sent us, to hire you, we want you to come up, and the king wants you to curse this people. Balaam now, his name means a destroyer of people. That's what the name Balaam means, destroyer of people. So now Balaam is actually ends up going, because if you'll notice, notice in verse number 15, um, it says that Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam, and they said, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming to me, for I will promote thee to very great honor. I'll do whatever you say to me. Uh, come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Balaam answered um, in verse 18, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I can't go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. And then he said, verse 19, Notice, now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye here also this night, that I may know more what the Lord will say, say unto me. In other words, okay, I know God told me not to go, but... Maybe he changed his mind. Now, 
Have you ever seen that picture with dollar signs in the eyes? That's Balaam. He's looking at money bags, and he's like, whoa. Guys, maybe don't be in a hurry. Chill out. Have a cup of coffee. Wait a minute. I'm going to go have a conversation with God. You know, maybe he'll change his mind. And so Balaam now um, is, uh, is, is revealing who he is. So God came to Balaam and said in verse 20, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. And notice in verse 21, Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. The guys didn't come. Balaam went. It's an important distinction. The guys didn't come. Balaam got up and left. And so it says in God's anger, verse 22, was kindled because he went. God got mad at him, okay? So Balaam is on his way now. And um, he's going to go back to the king, and he's going to use his magic against Israel. He's going to curse this people, and uh, he's going he's to divine. Remember, that was the same word that, um, that Pharaoh was using about the, the magic of his magicians. They were divining. They were trying to get in touch with the gods to, to do something. Okay, All of this is occultic, very occultic. All right, so Balaam, he was a soothsayer. God gives you that. He tells you that's exactly what it was. He was a soothsayer. Uh, he was a magician. Let me go back to this. He was a magician. Notice in Joshua chapter 13 here, it says, Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the, chil did the children of Israel slay. So he obviously died a little bit later on. But Balaam is a soothsayer. He's a magician. He is the Old Testament equivalent, if you will, of Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts. Balaam is an, an Old Testament equivalent of that. So this is now the rise of Moab. Moab is rising up against Israel. We don't want Israel passing through. And so we're going to do all that we can to, uh, to find a way to curse them because we can't fight them militarily. So look at Numbers 22. Then, then what we come to now is we come to uh, the strange encounter. I couldn't help myself. So try to focus on the Bible now, okay? Try to focus on the Bible. I just couldn't help myself with the picture. Look, when you're trying to figure out how to put a picture of a talking donkey, there's only one that came to my mind, all right? So let's look at Balaam's strange encounter here, okay? Because this was a strange encounter that we see. If you've never read this story, uh, we'll, we'll read this here. We're in Numbers chapter number 22. Notice in verse 22 of the same chapter, God's anger was kindled because he went. Now that tells you that he was actually going in disobedience to the revealed will of God. Okay, now listen. God told Balaam, no. Balaam came back to God the second time and said, please. And the Lord said, okay, if those guys come and say, rise up and go with us, you go, but you can only say what I'm going to tell you to say. And Balaam just got up in the morning and went, or Balaam got up in the morning and went, and God said, you're dead. Now, this may seem a bit vague in, in the moment, but when we look at the, the other verses in the Bible that tell us what happened in this story, you're going to see the why behind it. God's anger was kindled against him, and God was going to kill him. Now, when, anytime it says that God's anger is kindled against a man, it's a bad place for that man to be. Right? You're not going to get away with um, dodging whatever bullet God fires at you if God gets mad. And so that's the, that's the situation here. So we know the first group of elders came to Balaam, and uh, he turned them away, said, nope, God sends this, this other Group of three, they were more honorable men that come. They have a greater reward. And Balaam goes against the command of God. So God's angry with him because he went. And so then we get to this talking donkey. So let's read the story. Numbers 22, verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, or his donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and the sword drawn in his hand. So uh, I'm, are we okay with me just using the word donkey? Is that okay? All right, I'm just going to use the word. Um, so I want you to visualize this with this picture in your mind. But just visualize what's happening. Balaam's on the back of this donkey. And the donkey sees this angel standing in the way. Balaam can't see it, but the donkey sees it. All right? So he was riding, and the servants were with him, verse 23. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. So there's a sword there. And the, uh, the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the donkey and turned her into the way. So you have this, this donkey here that he's riding on, uh, sees the angel with a drawn sword. And so the donkey decides to take a detour into the field. So they're on the trail, and the donkey just goes 
off-grid, right? And so then what you see is Balaam gets mad at this thing. Notice in verse 23, and Balaam smote the ass, smote the donkey to turn her into the way. So have you, has anybody ever been around a donkey? Okay, if you've ever been around a donkey, here's, here's what you know about a donkey. They are the most hard-headed, stubborn things that exist. You can beat that thing with a cricket bat, and if it doesn't want to go anywhere, it's not going anywhere. It's going to lock its legs, and there's nothing you can do. You can hook up a tractor and pull it out of the way, but that's about all you're going to do. So you have this donkey, and anyway, it's funny because they're not like a horse. You know, if you ride on the back of a donkey, this is what you're doing the whole time. So Balaam goes trotting off into the field where he doesn't want to go, and so he starts beating this thing to try to get it back on, the, on track. He doesn't know what's happening. And so it says, uh, verse number 24, But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And so uh, Balaam beats this thing with a stick, try to get it back on the trail. And now, and now this donkey sees the angel again. And so notice it says that when, when, verse 25, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. Can you picture the, the scenario? So now the donkey's trying to get out of the way and it just crushes him up against the wall because the donkey's trying to avoid this, crushes, crushes his foot, and so he beats the thing with a stick again. Notice it says in verse 25, and he smote her again. Now he's his temper, right? He's about, he's furious at this stage. What is wrong with this stupid donkey? And so it says next that the angel of the Lord, verse 26, went further and stood in a narrow place and there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And now, now the donkey sees the angel and the donkey's got nowhere to go. I can't go left, I can't go right, and you're not going to get a donkey to walk backwards. So the only direction that thing goes is straight down. It says, the, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Straight down. Kaplunk. Can you see that? Okay. Straight down onto the trail, collapses on the trail, and Balaam is out of his head, and he starts whacking this thing, probably trying to kill the thing. Notice it says, verse 27, and he smote the ass with a staff. He got the biggest stick he could find, and he starts wailing on this donkey. And so he is absolutely furious, and he keeps whacking this donkey until she starts talking. Verse number 28. Now listen, if this ever happens to you, I got news for you. The donkey's not going to talk, all right? This is a one-off event. Look at verse 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? So they start having a conversation. I, I don't know why this doesn't seem strange to Balaam in the moment. I'm not really sure why this didn't seem strange to him because he answered the donkey, right? Uh, and Balaam said in verse number 29, look at it, because thou hast mocked me. Uh, I would, there were a sword in my hand for now I'd kill you. I wish I had a sword. If I had something to kill you with, I would kill you right now. It's what he has a conversation uh, with the donkey. It's funny, if, if you were to look in 2 Peter, you don't have to go there, but in 2 Peter chapter number 2, it says of this story that, uh, that Balaam was, was rebuked for his iniquity, his sin. He was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb or the, the, the ass, the donkey who has no ability to speak suddenly could speak. So this donkey uh, speaking with a man's, man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Remember, this was our title, the madness of the prophet. I'll explain that to you in just a minute. So now we get to this talking donkey. Uh, she has collapsed under Balaam on the trail. He's over it. He wishes he had a way to kill this donkey. All right. So this is the conversation. So Balaam said, you've mocked me. And I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. And then notice in verse 30. So the conversation continues. And uh, the, the donkey said unto Balaam, uh, Am I not thine ass, thy donkey, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? And was I ever wont to do so unto thee? Have, have I ever done this to you before? And he says, No. Okay, N not only are they having a conversation, but the donkey now is trying to reason with Balaam. Oh, it's a smart donkey. And he said, no. Uh, have I ever done this to you before? Balaam says, no. And then immediately notice verse 31. And then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And notice what happens to Balaam. He went down with the donkey, didn't he? And he bowed down his head and fell flat 
on his face. Down he goes. You know what God said of him? Verse 32, the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass, like this donkey, these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee because thy way is perverse before me. All right. I, I know we've talked about this before, but when you see the word perverse, perverted, pervert in the Bible, here's what it means. It means twisted. We would tend to use that word in the context of human sexuality and we say that person is perverted. Well, what does it mean? They have a twisted sexual moral. We would, that's how we would view that. But the biblical word here means twisted and it's not necessarily dealing with, with sex of any sort. It's just in general. God says to Balaam, your ways are perverse. You've twisted your ways against what's right. It's perverse before me and I'm withstanding you. Now, we know, of course, God could have healed Balaam without these three encounters with the donkey, right? He could have just stopped his heart, and it's over. He falls off the donkey, it's over. But, um, but you're learning a couple lessons here about, about Balaam. So Balaam is on his way to, to curse the nation, and uh, God intervenes with this donkey. So let's talk then about the, the subtlety here of Balaam. I want to talk to you about Balaam's subtlety. All right, now I, I do want you now to go with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. And this is where I want to take the story and I want to make a practical application because it needs to be made. You will read stories in the Bible and here's what you'll do. You'll say, why did God put this in here? So let's talk about why. 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter now is warning about the end days He's warning about the destruction of the, no, I'm going to say it the wrong way. He's warning about the, the twisting or perverting of right doctrine in the last days. And he uses a couple of things in this chapter by way of illustration. Verse number 12, sorry, verse number 10 of 2 Peter 2. Uh, Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They despise government. That's not talking about the government like you're thinking about. That, that it's talking about any governing authority over them. They despise it. Okay. All right. And so Peter's now going to explain these people. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed, all this stuff. Look at verse 12. They're natural brute beasts that are just made to be taken and destroyed. Turn, turn over and keep going. They'll receive the reward of unrighteousness, verse number 13. Look at verse 14. Their eyes are full of adult, adultery. They can't cease from sin. Verse 15. They have forsaken the right way. They're gone astray. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor. Notice this who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass, speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. All right, now, three times in your New Testament, God brings up Balaam. Of all of the things God could have brought up through the Old Testament, he, cho he cho chooses three times in the New Testament to bring this story up as an illustration of something. So when we talk about the subtlety of Balaam, I want to talk to you about what this means to you, a warning to you as a person, and what God has to say about it. Here, if you'll notice in 2 Peter 2.15, God uses an expression here, the way of Balaam. Do you see that in your Bible? It would be good for you to underline or circle these three things that we're going to look at and make a cross-reference note in your Bible, in the margin of your Bible, to link these three things together in the New Testament. Notice it says that these people, these false teachers that pervert the truth in our day, they're following after the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor. Notice this, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. The way of Balaam is a love of money. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's why he went with these guys, because they were offering him big bucks. There's no indication necessarily that Balaam wanted to be an evil person, no indication that he in any way said there's no real God. He actually said, we read this in Numbers 22, the Lord my God. He made a claim that God was really his. And yet what was more important to Balaam was the love of money, the wages of unrighteousness. And God calls that the way of Balaam. Balaam's way 
was to put God off to the side in favor of gain of money. Now, we could talk a lot about this tonight. The love of money is the root. Now, evil in the Bible is just bad. It doesn't mean horns and a pitchfork. The root of everything bad is traced back to covetousness, a desire for gain, the wages of unrighteousness, a desire for wealth. Are you listening? We listen to things like this, and we so easily let it pass through and out because we say, oh, that's not me. We say, this is not me. This is somebody else. Now, I'm not sitting here passing judgment on anybody. I'm, I'm literally not thinking of a single one of you, but I, I am thinking of you collectively as a church family and asking you to consider you because I don't know your heart any more than you know mine. Do you love the wages of unrighteousness the way that Balaam did? In other words, are you willing to put what you know to be right off to the side so that you can gain in some way? Are you willing to sacrifice your moral principles for what you can get out of it. I'm just going to put aside and put on the shelf my biblical convictions because if I, just, if I just say yes to this thing, then look at, how, look at the promotion I'm going to get. Look at the return I'm going to get. Look at the increase I'm going to get. I'm just going to put aside this biblical conviction so that I can gain from this. That's an easy thing for us to do. It's easy to sacrifice your principle when you see bags of gold. Because you know what we, we tend to say to ourselves? I can always just ask God to forgive me. That's what we do. We put ourselves into a little confessional booth and say, I'll just deal with this on Sunday and say my little, you know, however many Hail Marys to the priest and I can get, uh, 1 John 1, 9 still applies. So I'll just go ahead and do it and then I'll apologize to the Lord later. But we know, look what I've gained. And we can sacrifice our principles. This is the way of Balaam. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. It was the love of money. And you've got to ask yourself the question as a Christian, is this me? It's not wrong to make money. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to invest money. It's wrong to love money. Do you love it? Okay, that's the, that's the way of Balaam. Look at Jude, if you will, right before the book of Revelation. Book of Jude. Now, this is similar, but it stands, I think it stands in distinction. Jude is just one chapter. And so let's drop down to verse, uh, sorry, verse 10, a similar context to what we read in Peter. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain... And notice they've ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. And they perished in the gainsaying of Korah or Korah. The ground split. We talked about Korah earlier. Okay, notice here, God says here, they've gone after greedily after the error of Balaam. Now the end result was the same as the way of Balaam. It was reward. It was money. But let's talk about the error and what the error was. Okay, you know what Balaam's error was? I'm going to tell you what it was. This is why verse 22 of Numbers 22, where God, God was angry and was going to kill him. Here's what the error of Balaam was. Balaam was trying to circumvent God. He knew what he wanted, and he knew God stood in the way with a principle or a command. No. So the error that Balaam had was to circumvent the... Are you listening? circumvent the clear command of God to get what he wanted anyway. And that's why it says that the dumb ass, the donkey, uh, spake with a man's voice and he forbade the madness of the prophet. The madness of the prophet is not talking about he was out of his mind like a crazy man. The madness of the prophet was he was so overcome with a greed and a desire for gain and his own self-interest that he was willing to circumvent what he clearly knew God told him to get what he wanted at the other side. That was his error. And I'm telling you this, this happens to you and I as easily as a drop of a pin. We can easily circumvent what God has told us because we're headstrong. We have self-interest at our heart if we're not careful. 
we're going to do what we're going to do because we want to do it, and we don't care what God had to say about it. And God calls this here the error of Balaam. It's looking for a way around the command of God. How dangerous is that? You understand that's why the story is here. The story of God meeting Balaam to try to kill him is because he's trying to circumvent the clear command of God, and God says, I'll have none of that. Okay, now maybe God's not going to do the same thing in my life as a child of God today, but the principle stands today. It's clearly given to us in the New Testament. This was an error on Balaam's part, and God says, don't you make that same mistake where you circumvent what I told you in my word just so you could get what you want. Do you understand the error? The end result of it was still he wanted reward, just like it was in Peter. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. But that was his way. This is his error. This is where he went wrong. He went wrong because he was circumventing God because he wanted to do what he wanted to do. Okay, the stubbornness of this guy. And it's easy to point the finger at Balaam, but guys, we all have the same heart if we're not careful and we'll stubbornly want our way and step out of the way of God, okay? Now go with me to Revelation, then you're just a page or two away from this, chapter two. I wanna show you the third one, and this may be a little bit more um, in your face. And that's okay. We're not in a hurry tonight. This was actually a little bit of a shorter um, story but I wanted to save a little bit of time at the end for this so I could make an application here. All right, is everybody there? Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse number 14. This is now uh, Pergamus he's speaking to. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. He said in verse 15, you also have them that have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He said, I hate these things. So he said in verse 16, repent. All right, now listen. Peter said Balaam had a way. The way of Balaam was to love money. Jude said Balaam had an error. The error of Balaam was try to get around what God said so he could do what he wanted. John tells us in the book of Revelation that Balaam has a doctrine. And this is where uh, it affects you and I uh, at a deeper level, a, a very personal level, the doctrine of Balaam. Notice the definition of it in this verse, verse 14. It says, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. All right, let me just tell you this story. Back in Numbers 22, Balaam now sees the angel has a conversation with the Lord. The Lord shows mercy to him and says, I'm not going to kill you, but when you stand before Balak the king, you're only going to tell him what I tell you to tell him. And so Balak goes, sorry, Balaam goes, stands before Balak. Ba Balak shows him from some high point, okay, here's all these people out here, curse them. So Balaam's going to open his mouth and curse him, but instead he blesses them because God was intervening. No, these are my people. Balak says, hey, what's going on with you? No, 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 I didn't want you to do that. Okay, maybe you need a better view. So Balak takes him over to this other place. He says, okay, now you can see him a little bit better over here. Um, curse him. And so I'm, I'm skipping a few points, but Balaam essentially opens his mouth and blesses them again. Not only does he bless them, but in, in Balaam's uh, speaking of this blessing, he actually gives some great second advent prophecies in all of that, Okay. Okay, Balak's like, whoa, time out. What's wrong with you? Don't bless him, curse him. All right, now listen, you don't have a, a very good view. Let me give you the best view. So they go to, you know, round three. Here's a better view. Balaam does exactly the same thing. Okay, that's the story. But then God says here in Revelation 2, I, I want to tell you about the doctrine of Balaam because he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the people. Okay, now here's the story. At the end of those three times, all he did was bless Israel and not curse them the way Balak wanted. Balak is furious, sends him home. What did I even bring you here for? Balaam's on his way home, or maybe he gets home, because later on he's still in the, the land of the Midianites so, and dies there. So he probably didn't make it all the way to where he wanted to go. But nevertheless, Balaam gets a certain distance away from Balak and says, you know what? There's still a way for me to get the money I want. Never forget, Balaam's interest was Balaam. 
He wanted money, right? That's the whole story is Balaam wanted money. So what he did was he went back to Balak, whether he did it physically or sent a messenger. He went back to Balak and said, listen, God will not let me physically say anything to curse the nation, but I'll tell you a way around it. A way around it. Does that sound familiar to you? The error of Balaam? I'm going to get around God. Okay, so Balak, let me tell you a way around it. Here's what's going to happen. And so Balaam now introduces Balak to the nation of Israel and the law of God. And Balak sa Balaam says to Balak, okay, king, listen, here's what you got to do. It's simple. It's not going to cost you anybody. No soldiers have to die. They're all going to die. I promise you. Here's what you do. God gave these people a promise. The promise God gave to these people is they're going to have a land which is just on the other side of the Jordan River up here. Okay, it doesn't belong to you, but they want to pass through your land. So God's promised them this land. But God also gave them his law. Because they're his people, they're now under the rule of his law. And one of the things that God said to his people is they can't commit adultery and they can't commit fornication. In other words, there's no monkey business amongst these people. They're pure and they're moral and they're committed to themselves and they're committed to their God. And God said very clearly that if they do these things, God will judge them for doing them. So Balak, let me tell you what to do. You don't have to send any soldiers. Send your women. And all they need to do is dress really skimpy and go down into the camp. And the whole, the whole army that's standing down there, they're, they're, they're going to see it's not soldiers that are coming. It's prostitutes that are coming. And all they need to do is go in and infiltrate the camp and have immorality with all the people. And then God will judge his own people. You don't have to do anything. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the nation of Israel because he knew that if he could commit them to, to have them commit them, themselves to infidelity and immorality, that God would judge them and Balak wouldn't have to lift a finger. Do you understand the, sense, the situation? That's what he's talking about here. So the doctrine of Balaam was this. I'm just going to teach you how to make God judge his own people for immorality and you don't have to lose a single soldier. And that's what happened. That's what happened. He was teaching Balak here to teach God's people to do things that God himself would have to judge. Now, specifically, there were two things given. To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So there was idolatry and there was sexual immorality. And if the people of God could learn those two things, God would judge them himself. That's the doctrine of Balaam. So let's talk about what happened. There were 24,000 Israelites that died that day because of this. Because of this sin, there were 24,000 of them that died. You can find that in Numbers chapter number 25. Let, let's make it real personal and <clears throat> let's think about this for just a minute. The, the, the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians that you and I, as the people of God, are to flee fornication. Uh, every sin that a man committeth is without the body, but he that commits fornication sinneth against his own body. Don't you know, Paul said, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? It's the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells within you. Well, you're bought with a price. So, therefore, as a result of that, are you listening tonight? Glorify God in your body, physical body, and in your spirit, because both of, those things, both of those things belong to God. Your body is the temple of God. The Holy Ghost dwells inside of you if you're saved. So, God says that, that adulterers and whoremongers, God said he would judge them. We know that, that sexual immorality is an offense to God. We know that we are called to be holy. Peter tells us that. Because the Lord said, I'm holy. So I want you to be holy. So what happens then is we as believers, we learn from the world sexual immorality. And we embrace sexual immorality. 
and we adopt sexual immorality into our, into our life. And we do it through media, and we do it through social media, and we do it through, okay, we do it through all of these avenues, and we invite, we invite sex and sexual immorality into our life as believers, and we force God to chasten us in the flesh because of our impurity. God has obligated himself to chasten us when we get out of line. Hebrews tells us very clearly. God chastens those that he loves because we're out of line and we won't get back in line. We would go back into 1 Corinthians 11 in a different context, but the same principle. God is saying, okay, we're going to have the Lord's table here. You're going to remember the Lord's death for you. But if you don't have your life clean before you take partake of this, God said, I'm going to judge you in the flesh. There will be condemnation in your flesh. The condemnation, we've talked about this many times, is not eternal condemnation. It's the condemnation of God's judgment in my flesh. God says, I'm going to deal with you physically. And for this cause, Paul said, there are many that are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There's some that have died because their life was so, uh, so rotten in sin, and then they would dare to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, knowing that they were living in willful disobedience and rebellion to the God, and God said, I'm going to judge you for this. And so it is with sexual immorality. We invite the judgment of God because our life is not clean. This is what the devil does. Now, there's not, I'm not saying the devil's sitting on every shoulder and everything we ever do is the devil's, okay? I understand that we have flesh. But the devil understands humanity. You guys, he understands your human nature way better than you understand it yourself. He's been dealing with, with humans from the first one. And so for 6,000 years of human history, he knows how we are. He knows how we think. And all he's ever seen in humanity is a fallen nature, correct? I mean, outside of Eve and Adam in one brief moment, and from that time until today, all he's ever seen is a fallen nature. He knows how to deal with our fallen nature, so here's what he does. He has the same doctrine that Balaam had. Balaam got it from his father, the devil. What he will do is he will seduce you to sin. He will provoke the lust that's just naturally inside of us as human beings. It sits in there and lies dormant within us as long as we're walking in the spirit. We're not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. All of that lies dormant on the inside until we stop walking with the Lord. Listen to me. Until we stop walking with the Lord and our guard is down and our spiritual reserves have been tapped and we're weak and we're, we're vulnerable and then the flesh rises up and the lusts that have been kept under control rise up once more within us. And if we're not walking in the spirit, we're fulfilling those lusts and we're inviting the judgment and chastening of God. And the devil provokes that amongst the people of God. The doctrine of Balaam that he talks about here in Revelation 2 was happening in the church. He was talking to the church at Pergamos, was he not? It was within the church. We're not talking about what happens at the club downtown. We're talking about what was being tolerated and, and not just tolerated, but embraced within the church. It was the people of God that were doing this. They were following this doctrine. They had been taught, they were learning from the world to commit fornication to defile the, the temple that God made them to be. And they were inviting God's judgment in their flesh. This is such, it's such an important topic that we don't want to talk about in church. I want to invite you to go back again to Galatians and Colossians and look there at the, the lists that God gives you about what happens in our flesh. The lust of the flesh are manifest, visible, they're evident. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. In other words, every perverted and twisted expression of sexuality, those are the lists that God gives that are on the inside of us in our old nature. Now, we're not obliged to do those things anymore because we have been cut off from that old nature. The Spirit of God can give us victory over those things. But don't, don't mistake the fact that regardless of your age or your gender, uh, those things lie within you still. And they will rapidly come out of you if you don't walk with the Lord. And the doctrine of Balaam is, is circulating the world. 
circulating in the church. Pornography. Pornography is this doctrine. Insidious, creeps in, filters into everything. It affects men, it affects women, it affects singles, it affects young kids, it affects marrieds, it affects everything. It's not the only type of sexual expression that's wrong, but it is a prevalent issue. Becoming now more and more prevalent, and I'm hearing about it more and more in the church. This is the doctrine of Balaam that creeps into the church. And okay, uh, among other things that it does, not only does it invite God's chastening and judgment in our life as, as God's people, but we wonder why the church is weak and powerless. We wonder why we have no zeal for the things of God. We, we wonder why we, we don't have a care for lost souls, why we don't seem to have a passion for the Lord why we, we just seem to be governed by self-interest and the things of God just seem to be, well, I'll get to it if I, if I want to get to it. We wonder why there's no spiritual passion and fervor. We wonder why maybe men aren't being called to preach. We, we wonder why all these things are happening. Have we ever stopped to think that maybe this error, this doctrine is in our church and the spirit of God is unable to do his work amongst us because we are hindering, we are quenching, we are grieving God in our midst. This is the doctrine of Balaam. That's what God's warning is about. If this is an issue in your life, let me just say a couple things about that. Um, you're not alone in that issue. This is one of those things that nobody wants to talk about and nobody ever wants to go and get help for because I think it's, we consider it to be the most shameful thing that we could ever own up to. And so we don't own up to it and we don't get help and we don't seek help. And we sink further and further. So you're not alone if this is something that you deal with. But number two, you're not going to be able to deal with this by yourself. You can't deal with this by yourself. You can read the Bible 20 hours a day and you're not going to get victory over this by yourself. You're going to need help. You're going to need mentoring, guiding, accountability. There's a process you're going to have to go through to break this bondage in your life. Because it's not just spiritual bondage, it's physical and physiological bondage. And the Spirit of God can help you break that, but you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Don't walk out of here. Don't go through the week, if this is something that you're dealing with, without reaching out and saying, can you please help me? Because you can be helped. I, I would take you back to walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, that's not a pipe dream, it's a promise. So you can be taught again what that means and, and how to have victory in this area. But this is something that this will sink. This will sink a marriage. This will sink a family. This will sink a friendship. This will sink a church. Immorality. Don't let it be once named among you, God says. So let me give you a conclusion of all of this. Here's the summary then uh, that leads us to where we are today, okay? Uh, we have, well, I'll just turn and let you see this. So we have back in 1635 B.C., we have Joseph dying. And then Exodus chapter 1, we have Ramses that's here, and this is uh, basically the start of the Exodus journey. Moses is born in 1571, as you can see here. He, he flees at the age of uh, 40, goes off into the, the wilderness, the burning bush, we can see at the age of 80. And then in the same year, 1491, in the burning bush, this is the year of the Exodus. And the Exodus takes place, and I couldn't have picked a better graphic. This is what they did for 40 years, basically, and wandered. And uh, then we get here now to, this is the River Jordan. You can't tell that, but that's what that is. They get to the River Jordan, and 1451 is when, uh, when they cross over and step into the Promised Land. So we'll notice there's a change of dispensations. We've gone from, from the dispensation of promise uh, under Abraham to now the dispensation of law under Moses at Mount Sinai. And so now for quite a long time in our study, we're going to stay with the dispensation of law. That's going to carry through uh, for a number of years through the Old Testament, and then that will change as well. So that's kind of where that leaves us now. When we get back together again uh, our next Sunday night, um, it, will, it will lead us right to the, the story of uh, Jericho crossing into the Promised Land and really a, a whole new chapter in the life of the nation and a whole lot of different stories that are going to take place 
and so things, things will begin to move a little bit more quickly as far as the timeline goes. But uh, from here now, they move into their promised possession, and uh, we'll look at that next time. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word tonight.